Okay, thank you very much for coming along today, for getting out of the sunshine, really appreciate it. Um, welcome to Information is Beautiful. Uh, my name is Dr. David Forrest. I'm a lecturer in film in the School of English at the University of Sheffield. Um, what we're going to be exploring today is the relationship between academic research and filmmaking. So fundamentally, a few questions really. What happens when academic research and filmmaking combine uh, to produce intellectually rigorous but emotionally engaging narratives? Um, and what does genuine collaboration between academics and filmmakers look like? And finally, how can we change the way that academic research is disseminated so that it can reach wider audiences and have more impact? So we are joined appropriately by uh, two academics and two filmmaking professionals. Each person is going to speak for 10 minutes and then there'll be an opportunity uh, for you to ask questions at the conclusion. First up, we're going to have Stephen Farrell, Professor Stephen Farrell. Stephen's Professor of Criminology in the School of Law and Director of the Centre for Criminological Research at the University of Sheffield. He's studied why people stop offending, the fear of crime, and is currently exploring the long-term effects of Thatcherite social and economic policies. These research interests have in part manifested themselves in filmmaking outputs, and Stephen will be discussing uh, the film that he was involved in, The Road from Crime, uh, today. We're also joined by Michelle Coomber. Michelle's a director and a producer of documentary films who's currently working with Stephen and Emily on a film about the effect of Thatcherite social policies on crime. So after we hear from Michelle, we'll have Dr. Emily Gray. Emily is a criminological researcher at the Law Department of, Uni of Sheffield University. She specialises in longitudinal policy evaluations, emotional responses to crime, and persistent youth offending. Emily is particularly interested in visualising data in innovative and engaging ways. And last but by no means least, we'll have Jacqueline Haig, who's a screenwriter and treatment editor who's worked in similar collaborative projects, namely between filmmakers and industry. So everyone will have 10 minutes, um, and I'll be sticking to those times strictly. Uh, but there will be an opportunity at the end, as I say, for Q&A. So without further ado, Stephen, can you begin? OK, lovely. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to show you uh, three clips from a film which I made uh, with colleagues uh, who work at um, the University of Glasgow and at Queen's University Belfast. The film was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, which I have to say at the beginning, otherwise they won't give me any money ever again. Um, and essentially, it was an attempt to encourage probation staff and other people that work in those bits of the criminal justice system that kind of revolve around um, probation, housing departments and um, other kind of bits of the third sector, to think about the way in which they supervise offenders, as they sometimes refer to them, or service users, uh, in the community. For a long time, far too long in my opinion, probation services um, thought that it was what they did to people who they were supervising that were the reasons why these men and women stopped offending and started to use, started to lead much more useful um, lives. Research which I had conducted uh, and research which the guy at Queen's Belfast and, and the thinking from those findings which the guy at Glasgow had started to kind of develop um, suggested actually that lots of the reasons why people stop offending are to be found away from the criminal justice system. They are about um, good, positive relationships with other people, uh, about employment, about having a sense of hope in the future. And it was against that kind of backdrop of probation services trying, wanting to do one thing, and, and ourselves saying, well, actually, no, that, we don't think that's going to work, that we, um, that we wanted to make this, um, this film. So I'm going to ask for the first clip, which is the very beginning of the film, to be played now. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Alan Weaver. I spent 12 years of my life getting in and out of jail as a prisoner. But I travelled the road away from crime. Today, I go into prisons as a probation officer, trying to help others avoid the mistakes I made. But this film isn't about me. It's about what can be learned from stories like mine.
I suppose there's nothing unusual about my route into crime and criminality. I grew up here in Salkoats, a small town in Scotland struggling with the 1970s recession. I don't think any of my teachers expected me to achieve anything. I was just trouble to them. They didn't see the long shadow that my father's violence towards my mother cast over my childhood. Though I hated the way he treated her, I also learned that violence brings a kind of power and control. Okay, so um, from that point onwards, Alan goes and interviews various people who either know about why people stop offending because they've studied it or um, know about it because they are uh, probation officers who supervise people in the community or, most importantly of all, those people who have actually made the journey away from um, engagement in crime themselves. So the film, which is 48 minutes long, was... Uh, was designed so that we could take it to various different practitioner groups, mainly centred, as I said earlier, around probation, and show them the film, and then through a process that's known as appreciative inquiry, which is focusing on the good things that different organisations and institutions do, focus on how they can take the work that they were currently doing um, and rethink it. And this, the, these seminars where the film was shown included obviously people from different probation services, um, groups like Bernardo's, um, former service user groups like Unlock or User Voice, and just kind of individuals who had been engaged in crime themselves. In some instances also some members of um, prison service staff. So we showed, these, um, the, showed this film to people in... England, Scotland, uh, and Northern Ireland, which is where we all based our respective institutions. Then we did further showings in other particular uh, probation services that had um, asked for it. I'm now going to ask for another, or the second section of the film that I want to show you, which is with um, two of the former offenders who now work as drug counsellors um, to be shown. Thanks. That I didn't set out in life to become a criminal. I didn't set out to become a drug addict, um, you know, to be quite honest with you, it just happened. Uh, and my experience is once I was in that world, um, you know, it became a normal part of everyday life. My kids started sort of asking, my eldest in particular, was starting to ask uh, questions like, well, why don't you go to work? Now that was quite painful to listen to that. I had a son, a bit like Charlie was saying, his kids big factor in the way I turn, had to turn my life around. But um, the obstacles were um, heroin and crack and not being able to, having the fear around withdrawing and giving up and living life just with myself. The fear of coming and doing something different was immense, you know, and I'm not talking quite uh, lightly here. I had to go through a process, and it was a painful process as well, believe you me, to admit that I was wrong. For the last 25 years, what I've been doing and how I've been functioning um, has been wrong. But my changing process was not overnight. Mm. You know, it was not overnight. And I think this is where people get confused. A light comes on uh, and, you know, you admit you're wrong and then you moved on, you know, to the, to the solution of, of finding the recovery. My, my process is not like that. My process is probably, you know, trying to think back. It's been about five years you know, from start to finish. Going a bit back to what Charlie was just saying about having a good look at yourself, there's a step four that's taking inventory and looking at me, you know, which is not nice, it's uncomfortable, but that's what needs to set, that's what I need to do to set me free from, say, the bondage of self. Okay, so, uh, as I mentioned, the, the film's 48 minutes long and it was, um, designed not just to be uh, the platform for these, these discussions, which I referred to earlier, but also designed as a tool which could be used in practice by probation staff working with um, people that they were supervising, either to be watched in one go or, more realistically, to be shown in little bits. So the, the, the film, which we made available um, as a DVD as well, has four 
chapters in it, which, which are all about 10 to 12 minutes long, which I think form the basis, or could form the basis of discussions between a, a, a supervising probation officer um, and the kind of person that, 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 the, the, the person that they're, they're working with. Um, the film we also had um, translated into various different languages uh, so that it could be used in practice around the world. And indeed, um, it has been shown around the world, quite often not by us. Um, there are colleagues that I know in, um, in either other universities or who work in probation services that do outreach work in other countries who uh, say, oh, well, you, we showed your film to some people in Jamaica, I think was the last one that I heard of. Um, I should say that some people do struggle with the Scottish accents, um, but thankfully it's also available to be watched in subtitles in English, which I gather has been used on some occasions. I say that as somebody who, although I sound like I, I, well, I grew up in the south of England, I was actually born in Scotland, so I say that with a slight lump in my throat. Um, the film, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll ask for the last bit of the film to be shown now, if you wouldn't mind, and then I'll say a few things by way of wrapping up, and then we'll hand over to Michelle. So I have to ask, is our justice system making diseases easier or making it more difficult? I put this question to Liz Dixon and Nick Paul of London Probation Trust. What role do you think the probation officer has got to develop and support that, that process of desistance? I think desistance is a bit like raising a child, you know, you need a village. Desistance is a community thing. You need the community, you need work, you need family, you need relationships. So if you're just constantly on the computer, how are you? How do you know there's the Prince's Trust thing out here? How do you know there's a new scheme coming up? So people who stay very office-based and not using the community, then we, what we, you know, we're, we're not, we're not actually doing desistance. We're getting people through, we're ticking the boxes, but we're not actually stopping offending behaviour. What happened from uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago when uh, when there was a particular type of model, um, when the cognitive behavioural model took mm. off. There was a certain arrogance, I think, really, wasn't there, mm. Nick, in terms of feeling that we could change people. Mm. And that if we just yeah. put them in the right groups and we put them in the right classes, yeah. that that would get sorted. It was... Yeah. It, yeah. It, and, 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 and something was thrown out, thrown out with a bathwater, really. Yeah. It, it was something about the fact that they actually de-skilled yeah. probation officers. Um, as of... Uh, 12 days ago, most parts of probation supervision in the UK have been privatised and are now run alongside um, organisations like Serco and Capita and indeed some third sector organisations. There's a certain sort of poignancy to some of the things that uh, they were saying there in the closing um, sections. The film had a website which is called Discovering Desistance um, to support it and you can watch the film for free from that. It's, it was put up there on, on the basis of um, Creative Commons. Um, last week, we discovered that the film had won second prize. We never win first prize. We win second prize for um, the funders, uh, what they call impact in public policy. So this was helping those people who are making public policy think about the ways in one, which they do it differently. So lots of supporting statements from things like the Ministry of Justice. Um, so we came second. We hope that uh, the next film which we make, which uh, Michelle will tell you a bit about in a moment, will do better than that. But I think on, on that point, I will end. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> so um, thanks firstly to DocFest for um, having us here and also for, for putting us together. Um, so the Thatcher documentary that I'm working on um, is part of a large research project investigating Thatcher's impact on crime in England and Wales. Um, the first thing to say is that I don't have any lovely clips to show you because we're in pre-production. So I, I'm not going to use this as a, a case study per se. I thought what might be most interesting for you is to hear about my motivations for, for wanting to be involved in this. Um, the, the synergies that we're already discovering um, between academics and, and filmmakers as we go along. And also the, the challenges of um, translating this quite fascinating um, academic research on, on complex social processes into a really engaging film that will um, uh, be watched by as broad an audience as possible. 
Um, so as academics and filmmakers, I think there are a lot of similarities. We're, we're knitting facts to context. Um, we, we both have different sorts of audiences that we want to communicate with in some way. And we're all intrinsically pretty nosy creatures. <laughs> um, I guess the trick is how we can compromise to, to amplify and not to dilute each other's messages. Um, I think it's a really smart and exciting thing to be doing and something that I'm seeing more of. Um, and just a couple of um, similar schemes to be looking out for. Birmingham University's um, business school um, is working with filmmakers um, on a project called Real Lives, um, which is commissioning filmmakers to produce films entirely from social media data. And Open City Docfest and UCL are now doing a project called Border Crossings between academics and filmmakers. So it's very much um, in the ether, these, these sorts of pairings. Um, the reason I wanted to get involved is because I thought this research was so interesting um, and an intervention into the debate around Thatcherism that I, I didn't know anything about. Um, but also because I think it echoes so many themes that are extremely pertinent today. Um, rising social inequality, polarization, stigmatization of the poor and unemployment and housing, all these things are, are swirling around us today. Um, so I think it gives this film a justification for, for why this project and why now. Um, the first thing I needed to do when looking at the research is to, to um, find the underlying scaffolding. What, what's the pure story that underpins it all, which isn't just a sequence of events, but what it's really about. Um, and I think it's about how much of today is shaped by the past. Um, and what are the useful questions or conclusions that we can employ in today's realities? So the challenges with, I think, with any um, academic um, and filmmaking partnership are, is this research the right thing to make a documentary about? It may be your baby and you find it completely beguiling, but that doesn't mean anyone else will necessarily care. Um, and um, obviously how to incorporate the research, which I'll, I'll go into in the way that I'm doing it a bit later. Um, and also how to ensure it's balanced. So Steve, Emily and Will had already decided well before I was on the scene that um, we were going to have politicians from both sides of the political spectrum. Um, and obviously Thatcher's legacy is, is always going to be a controversial topic. But we had one politician recently who declined to be interviewed because he thought the whole premise was tendentious. Um, I suspect you could argue that his um, declining is, is tendentious in some ways, but I, I think in a small way he, he was saying something that we need to think about. Um, academia may be based on rigorous data and it may be peer reviewed, but it doesn't have the same journalistic intent as, as what I think we need to do in this film, which is to try and be balanced, to give both sides of the debate and to give a, a right to reply. Um, so the, the main challenge with, with this project is the same as with any film, to find the strong story and the strongest way to tell it. And um, to do that by bringing data to life and strike the fine balance between simplicity and precision. And I'm, I'm always trying to sort of um, uh, remember the way that, that visual language within a film operates in, in quite a different way than the written text. Um, that this film needs a really high ratio of visual material to commentary. So it's not just a case of cramming in all the information and all the data um, and just trying to, to prettify it. You have to be really selective. And what you want to avoid with these sorts of films is to make illustrated radio. Um, paradoxically, if you put too much information into a film, your audience is actually going to go away having absorbed less. Um, and if you think about the way you, you engage with a film, um, it's this constant stream of sequences. And yes, you can stop it and rewind and go over separate parts, but really that's, that's not the way that we watch a film that we're enjoying. Um, you can't annotate it. Um, so how to open up this world, Thatcher's legacy, how to find the story and the narrative arc and ensure it has a payoff, why it's relevant now and why should people care. Um, the approach that we're taking it will be mostly interview based with, with expert witnesses um, and some of the techniques we're going to use are to treat the archive in a way where it's not just slotted in as wallpaper. We're actually going to try and tell the um, 
story, drive the story in some senses through the selection of um, clips that we're going to use. Please don't ask me to give an example because we're not quite at that stage yet. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing with the archive is um, to make it seem as though it's projected onto walls and buildings of um, different surfaces of, of key locations in the film. And the reason we're choosing to use it in this way as well as just slotting it in in the normal way is to use it as a, a kind of um, palimpsest to, to give this sense of history really being embedded in the, in the places that we're going to. Um, we're going to be presenting the graphics in a really interesting way that um, embeds them in the texture of the place. Um, so one of the things that we were thinking of is to use street signs and location signs that transform from the, the locations they depict into our, um, into our key stats or key statements that we want to make. So always trying to, to embed these stats somehow into the narrative rather than just popping up. Um, so one thing that we're still deciding on, but that I'm, I'm certainly quite passionate about, is to feature ordinary people as well as experts in this film. Um, because I think that's where we'll find the emotion and the relatability and something that penetrates the, the um, political or the academic speak. I think it's really important that we see the way that ordinary lives have been um, disfigured by politics and, and we hear the stories from them. Um, so, I mean... We're, we're just at the start of this process. We're, we're um, uh, always remembering that it's very much a two-way street um, and in constant sort of collaboration. I'm being sent some really wonderful and strange references from, from <laughs> Steve and Emily, which I'm enjoying. And um, from my point of view, I, I think what I need to, to remember is key, is to engage with this research thoughtfully and respectfully and with depth and sophistication. Thanks. Emily. Thank you. Um, so I'm one of the acad academics, and I'm working with Steve on this project, and I'm coming to it at a, a slightly different angle. My talk's on a slightly different angle, is that um, the project that we're working on is very kind of heavily statistically based. It's looking at longitudinal data from some, I don't know, really early on from sometimes the 1950s on to the present day. So we have a lot of statistical data. And there's a challenge for us to kind of make that interesting and um, understandable. And in some respects, the, the data is quite easy to, to kind of eyeball because it changes over time. You can have nice line diagrams and so on. But uh, we've got a lot of them, and they can be quite boring at times. Um, and academics can be quite boring at times. So I'm just going to speak about how... Um, you can, we can start telling kind of nice visual stories through infographics. Um, and it has to be said that, you know, academics don't really kind of look at those kind of visual or sensory aspects. We can tend to do everything on print. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to speak about those. Uh, I'm assuming most people know what infographics are. They're kind of these nice little visual stories that you quite often see on the front of The Guardian or The Independent... Um, sort of thing that you, is used by the BBC at election night and so on. They have these swingometers that show you the, uh, the results as they come in. And they're really nice ways of kind of condensing quite complex stories into little kind of bite-sized pieces. Um, so this, uh, from where I'm coming from, um, this is how academics tend to... Th these are our traditional outputs. We write lots of books, or if we're lucky to get published, that is... Um, and they tend to be quite big, thick, heavy books that are written in kind of large black and white print. Um, if the alternative to a book is that you might write in a journal that looks something like that, and I don't expect people to be able to read that, but that's typical. Um, and they're not, they're not really very cheap or easy to access if you're outside of a university setting. If you do happen to get hold of anything, you might see a diagram that looks like this. And this is a, a path diagram that I built for my PhD research, which shows, um, as you can obviously tell, how um, it tests how, what happens to persistent young offenders as they grow up. And over time, over a period of seven years, it tests all the different um, influences that might kind of help them stop or, or continue offending, um, if that wasn't obvious. Um, 
understandably, not many people can access this. So th these are kind of very complex stories. Um, and, I mean, journals are quite difficult to read. So even if you kind of do get to a journal, you do get to an academic book, they can be very hard to kind of penetrate. Um, and, yeah, they tend to be read in libraries. So that's the kind of challenges that we were facing when thinking about, you know, how do we get our data out there to a, a bigger audience? And uh, Steve touched on that the people that fund us are really kind of putting pressure on academics, rightly so, to put their information out to the general public. So it, it does impact people, and people do understand it and pay um, and, and absorb it. I mean, our research is funded by taxpayers, so it's, you know, it's incumbent on us to make sure that people understand it. And, and particularly in the sort of research that myself and Steve do, it's very kind of policy orientated. Um, you know, if you find out what makes offenders stop offending, or if you find out what, how people feel on the streets late at night, or, or um, that women and children don't report rapes because they're very anxious about it and they don't think they're going to be believed and so on. You know, that's the sort of information that we need people to kind of really understand and for the public to kind of take on board. So it is a, our exercise is not just to kind of find out statistics, but to kind of win over hearts and minds. And that's a, that's a really key element of the sorts of research that we do and over and above that you know the challenge now is how we move and how we uh, get those messages out there we're living in an information age there's huge volumes of data it's quite often contradictory and um, very complex so how do we um, enhance the understanding of the of these messages and stories that we're getting um, to a, a more general public um, so thinking outside of the kind of criminological or law um, block, infographic artists of the 21st century, as well as kind of poets from um, ancient history, kind of have told us that actually if you want to get information out there and if you want it to be understood, the best way to do it is actually to kind of get it in a digestible format. And in many respects, less is more, um, which is not something that academics are very good at. I'm, I worked on a project and I think it cost something like 1.3 million pounds. There was 15 people working on it and it was paid for by the government. And at the very end of the process, you know, we had written, I don't know, thousands of pages of stuff and, and then, uh, you know, we, we took it along to the government and they went, what we'd really like is it condensed to two pages. And uh, we were kind of, what? You know, all this work and all these kind of footnotes and all these bits of, you know, it, it just didn't kind of register with us in many ways, but, um, you know, in many respects, less is more, and in terms of kind of getting out to the general public, I mean, there's a, of course there's a place for um, books and uh, journal articles and, and, and intense kind of technical debate about things, but in terms of getting out to a broader public, less is quite often more. Um, so... Uh, writers, designers, psychologists have come to the conclusion that effective communication should have, you know, an aesthetic appeal. It should be able to engage a voluntary audience. It should be comprehensible. Um, it should have, uh, a, be easy to understand for the kind of man on the street. And you should be able to retain that information. You should be, a, it should kind of penetrate your memory and your emotions for it to be recalled, you know, an hour later, two hours later, so on and so forth. Um, aesthetic appeal is certainly not something that we think about very often um, in a university, but if you do, if you are able to kind of um, strengthen the illustrative appeal of a, a piece of work or a statistic, um, it can really enhance the, mess the take home message. There's a lot, it's not just about attracting people, it can actually um, in increase the understanding of the data. And here's quite a good example of. Um, some data that's produced in various formats. Uh, this graph shows the mounting costs of the American House of Representatives and the Senate um, expenditure on campaigns in millions of dollars over a 10-year period. And what it shows is that the um, smallest bar chart on the left-hand side at 1972, is about 70 million pounds had been spent on expenditure. Um, ten years later, that had gone up to $300 million, which is a very large increase, even taking into account the rate of inflation. 
And uh, researcher Nigel Holmes showed this graph to a group of participants who were non-specialists. And then he showed them an alternative one. And as you can see here, it's got there's this sort of big lizard-type monster and um, the teeth are used as a kind of bar chart to show the kind of mounting or what he calls their monstrous mounting costs of the amount of money that was being spent on these campaigns. And it's not hard to tell which one might appeal to um, a non-specialist audience. Um, and they kind of consistently preferred this one. And not only did they find it more attractive, but they found it easier to comprehend, easier to kind of um, absorb the take-home message. It's very clear what it's saying. And easier to kind of then describe to others over a period of time. So, you know, there's, there's a real kind of value in, in doing it. It's not just in a kind of an artistic enterprise. It's also an intellectual enterprise. The other thing, it's kind of worth thinking about how people actually learn and how they take in information. Not everyone wants to has time to kind of read a book, and the majority of information actually comes to us online that we may only look at, you know, for seconds before we kind of move on to something else. Um, psychologists have demonstrated that we are able to acquire a lot more information through um, our visual system, and apparently this is something to do with pre-attentive attributes that images have these kind of pre-attentive attributes that perceive information very quickly and our brains are able to process it um, with quite a lot of accuracy in, in the sense that actually we don't have to, if you, do, if you do it right, you don't have to do that much to kind of tell a story. And an example of this is if you look at this figure and try to count the number of sevens in the number set, Give you a moment to have a look at that. Any contributions? And how confident are you that you've um, identified all of them? Where if you look at this. Um, version, a colour change kind of makes an almost um, immediate and instant difference to seeing where the data patterns are. I mean, it's a really obvious exercise, but there are very simple ways of just kind of putting things in bold or different colours or in a kind of new context to just make information stand out and, and give the take-home message much easier. And those who said 10 were right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Basically, all uh, visualizations contain these kind of pre-attentive attributes, and using them properly to convey messages is, is really kind of key to this sort of visual communication. Um, visual presentations also kind of encourage a greater uh, emotional response to the data. Um, again, if we take this example, I, unfortunately, it's not, it's not um, very, very clear, but... Um, this graphic is taken from the Independent newspaper in 2013, and it uses data from the Ministry of Justice, and it compares um, rape cases, the number of rape cases reported to the number of rape cases that were then kind of moved down the criminal justice system. I'll kind of explain that the, the black figures, 95,000 rapes were estimated during a given year, I think it would be 2011 to 2012. Um, and these are the rapes that will be reported not just to the police but to researchers so people who've um, had some kind of um, sexual violence episode and have chosen some have chosen to report it and, and some haven't so there's about they estimate there's around about 95,000 rapes um, compared to the darker grey cases of um, sorry the, yeah the grey cases that were the officially reported to the police. So you can see the number kind of dramatically goes down. And then there's a sort of a brown section, and those are the people who went to court. And then you can see uh, the, those in red, the 1,070, were the cases where they actually got a conviction. That's actually a complex story that comes from pieces of research that has taken kind of years to really look at and years to develop the kind of right research methods to ident identify all those people in black and look at all the kind of other uh, records that, that track all these cases through a, a process. So that's a, a very complex piece of research that has been able to demonstrate a really kind of poignant message about how hard it is 
to get a rape conviction. And you know, as I say, this was on the front of the news. And so it, it it's, gets a very powerful story out there. And it's a, um, yeah, it's a demonstration of how kind of clever and creative use of graphics can help us translate statistical knowledge into kind of more memorable and stimulating and, and accessible knowledge. Uh, that's really the kind of end of what I wanted to say, apart from uh, Michelle spoke a bit about how we, thinking about the Thatcher project, how we're thinking about visual and visualising some of the, the data that we're looking at, and these are the, some, some of the examples we've got. And it, I mean, it's, some of these are pretty obvious as you start looking at kind of high-rise blocks of flats and, and the kind of city skyline from the London city. You can start seeing, oh yeah, that would work really nicely with kind of uh, certain bar charts and so on, and then the broken tiles, you know, you can have a nice line diagram that kind of works on that and looks at um, things over time. And of course, working with Thatcher, who's uh, an indomitable profile of, of her own, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of iconography that we can draw on that's really evocative and powerful. So we're hoping that this new exercise that we're doing, you know, we will speak to a lot of people, and of course, everyone knows who Thatcher is. Um, so that's the end. But if anyone wants to get in touch or follow details about the project, these are our contact details. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jacqueline. Thank you. So I'll start by introducing myself. I'm primarily a script writer and script consultant for fiction, but I am brought in sometimes to consult on documentaries, um, as a lot of the principles that apply to fiction also apply to documentaries. Because for me, at the end of the day, it's really all about storytelling. So I'm going to talk about the way of ensuring that the information you're presenting is powerful and effective through using story. Bye. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, He'll be sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> story is actually fundamental to the way that the brain works. So if you have a list of facts presented in a bullet point, only certain parts of the brain are activated, which is the language processing part of the brain, where we decode words into meaning. But through the use of story, story actually activates that, but also other parts of the brain that we would use if we were actually experiencing the events. So if I tell you a story about going to a restaurant and ordering, you know, and I order this delicious food and it comes out and it's sizzling and I eat it and it's amazing, it's actually going to activate the sensory cortex in your brain as though you were also eating that meal and experiencing it yourself. Um, and that process of activating the those parts of the brain, helps to ensure memory, so you actually remember the information as well. So what you're looking at here is really the emotion, and I believe if you want your film to have an impact, you have to activate the emotions of the audience and not just the intellect. And that means looking for the human story in the material you're using. I was brought on recently to consult on a series of documentaries that were being made by these real-like scientists, academic super boffins that had all been on TED Talks and, you know, had PhDs coming out of their ass. And <laughs> they were making these films about this range of technologies, really amazing technologies, but they weren't working. And I came in and I listened to it all and I was like, yeah, that's amazing, but where's... Where's the human story? How can I, who is not a scientist or a super boffin and doesn't have a PhD, how can I relate to this? Um, where's the human story? Um, so we were trying to look at, well, who's the human, their problem, their struggle, that this technology is then coming into, changing their life, and then there's a resolution through that. Because it's very hard for us to care about things in the abstract. You know, even if we're told the facts of how difficult something is, unless we can really identify with that personal struggle, it kind of, it's, it's hard for us to really feel the meaning of it. Um, and this was the process of identification that's fundamental to fiction storytelling. Um, but in fiction, we'll create a protagonist or a main character to create identification in the audience to make sure that the audience goes on the emotional journey along with that main character. <coughs> Um, and this technique you can also use in documentaries. So I want to show uh, the trailer now, if I may. Now the thing you ought to know about this Mini Cooper is it is small. We are in proportion, me and my car. My name is Robert Reich. I was Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton. Before that, the Carter administration. Before that, I was a special aide to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> of all developed nations, 
The United States has the most unequal distribution of income, and we're surging toward even greater inequality. 1928 and 2007 become the peak years for income concentration. It looks like a suspension bridge. Last year, we made 36,000. I probably make 50,000 a year, working 70 hours a week. The middle class is struggling. Now, people occasionally say to me, what nation does it better? The answer is the United States. In the decades after World War II, the economy boomed, but you had very low inequality. Do you know Robert Reich? I do indeed. He's a communist. When I was a kid, bigger boys would pick on me. I think it changed my life. I had to protect people from the people who would beat them up economically. Who is actually looking out for the American worker? The answer is nobody. If workers don't have power, if they don't have a voice, their wages and benefits start eroding. We are losing equal opportunity in America. Any one of you who feels cynical, just consider where we have been. Just out of interest, has anyone seen that film? Who's seen that film? Yeah, it's American. I don't, know if it, I don't think it's been out in Britain yet, maybe, but it came out in America last year. It was at Sundance and did very well. Um, so here you've got the subject of American economics, which could be a really boring, dry subject, you know, lots of state, uh, statistics and data, but, you know, how do you really get into it? So they bring us in uh, Robert Reich, and if you notice, they even put the thing about him being small and his mini Cooper before the credits. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with American economy, but by getting in, you know, a personal story, it's humorous, and it pulls us in before you get in, then, you, then they pull out into the economic story. So they use his personal life, his struggles with being small, um, and they tie this in, even though it doesn't really have anything to do with the history of American economics. So obviously he's a very unique character, he's got a very unique life history. And, um, and so they have that, that as almost like the spine of the film, and then they weave in and out, they come between his personal story and weave in and out with the history of American economics from the 1920s to today, using a, a sort of that suspension bridge mm. graph, similar to the way you're talking about, and they, they keep coming back to that. Um, in addition to him, there's another of, a number of other kind of recurring characters that we see um, who are people more actually struggling with economic problems. There's a very moving bit that, interestingly, they put very early into the film of a woman um, describing her problems, and she's trying to be very positive, and she's wearing shades so you can't see her eyes, but as she's talking, you just see this tear roll down her cheek. And you can imagine the filmmakers going, <laughs> that's gold, I'm getting in, that, in there right at the beginning, hook us in, you know, because once we're hooked in, we can listen to it. Um, but you, uh, you need to hook us in. So try and find that interesting main character or group of characters that are going to take you through the information and allow the audience to experience its impact. Um, a really classic example of this, if you want to look at, is the, uh, the documentary Super Size Me. Who's seen that? Most people? Yeah, that was the 19th highest grossing documentary film of all time, and it got nominated for an Oscar. And I think part of the reason for its success is because it's got such a clearly defined main character, Morgan Spurlock, and he's got a very clear goal to eat McDonald's every day for 30 days and see what happens. And then he faces a clear series of obstacles to that goal. So again, they're using that main character, goal, obstacle format that we use in fiction as the spine of the film. And then he's weaving that in and out with facts about McDonald's, statistics about American obesity, and all of the kind of information stuff. But it keeps coming in and out of that main, that main spine of the film. Um, and if you look at that film, it's very interesting to me watching it because it's got a very classic three-act structure. Uh, like we would use in a fiction film. And I really recommend for all documentary filmmakers to study the three-act structure in the way that we do in fiction because it's a really effective technique to pull the audience through a story and take them on a journey that makes them feel the emotions. Um, if you've seen, if you remember Super Size Me, uh, the three acts, first act, you've got the setup, Morgan, his girlfriend, uh, he's, he states his goal. Second act, he's struggling to achieve that goal, facing obstacles. We've even got a classic kind of midpoint in the middle, which is the point uh, in the middle of the film, there's a twist where things start going badly for the hero. Takes us down to um, the end of act two, which in fiction we'll sometimes call the big gloom or a whiff of death 
where his health is suffering. It doesn't look like, is he going to be able to even continue this or not before he keels over? Yes, he decides to continue, push into the third act, drive in the third act, and that even gives us a ticking clock, which is another principle from fiction where you have a ticking clock in the third act, which helps to make sure that the third act retains tension. So, you know, all of these things were the absolutely archetypical points that you get in a fiction film used in a documentary. And it's great because it also gives us a character arc in which the character changes because of the events of the story. Now, obviously, depending on your subject, you might not always be able to do that. Um, but even in Inequality for All, they sort of fake it. By going back, they start, and then they go back and tell Robert Reich's story and his character change um, by showing, like, you know, archive footage and photos of him to show how he's changed. So they still kind of give you that sense. And there's even a whiff of death in about three quarters of the way in where he talks about his friend who was his protector who was, who was murdered. And so that kind of uh, prompted him on to want to protect people. Um, how, how long, do I need to round up now? Yeah. yeah. And I, you'll even see this structure in things like, do you know A Place in the Sun? Has anyone seen that about English people moving to France and buying a jeet and doing it up? There's a three-act structure in that. I was watching it. I was amazed. And then the script, con the script consultant came up in the credit. So they've made sure that it's a, a, it's a proper story, a series of chain, a chain of cause and effect that actually pulls you through the, pulls you through the story. And if all this sounds really obvious, um, interestingly, I met a, a very nice and very successful sales agent earlier who was telling me he watches hundreds of documentaries, obviously thousands, and most of them are failing for these very reasons, that they're not, you know, they're not creating that kind of um, audience identification in that way. So when you've got your research and preparing the film, think what's the human story? Who's your audience? Really identify them. How can they relate to this story? Or what's their point of identification that they come in and go through the story so that you make sure they have the information is giving meaning um, with an impact and emotion. And to me, that's what makes it beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So much to our speakers. Um, can I ask that the roving mics be brought out? And we maybe put the lights up slightly so we can see if. Should we just get the lights up a little bit so we can see potential questions in the audience? If anyone has one, just got one on the front row here. Hi, I was just wondering if you could explain how you guys got together on the Thatcher project whether it was a call out to look for a director or if you found their research or, or how that relationship started and grew? We, um, <coughs> sorry, we uh, got the money from the funders, the Economic and Social Research Council, and then we advertised through DocFest for um, a producer director and then we had interviews and things like that. And with regard to the funding, um, I, I'd never thought of going to the um, ECRSC. Yes, how, how, how does that work? Have they got a collection of funds, or are you applying because you're an academic institution and you already have a relationship with them? Yeah, the Economic and Social Research Council is one of seven research councils which um, the UK is lucky enough to enjoy. Some, some countries just have one, for yeah. example. Um, so it's it, the, the people that it mainly gives money to are academic charities for which read universities. Um, and so uh, as an as a employee of a university, you can, you can apply to them and you can apply primarily in terms of the Economic and Social Research Council to do empirical social science research. But increasingly, those kind of funders, not just the ESRC, but, but all of them are asking you to think about the ways in which you're not just going to disseminate your findings, but also the ways in which you're going to disseminate your findings in such a way that that has some kind of measurable impact on that thing that we call society, which can be all sorts of different things. So in the, the, the road from crime, the, um, the kind of the, the, the impact buttons that we were hitting were you know, probation trusts as they then were, the Ministry of Justice, third sector organisations. In the grant on Thatcher, um, the impact, if indeed we have an impact, uh, the, the narrative there is very much around 
um, public understanding of itself rather than public understanding of science, but it's public understanding of what it is. So it's a kind of a much harder to measure um, impact, which may or may not be a good thing. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of story that we were telling in terms of getting the funding. Sorry, one more. Are you, do you, is, is the research less defined on Thatcher and that actually part of the process is making this programme and going down on the streets, sorry, documentary, and, and, and talking to people and therefore you finding that the research is less conclusive than, say, Road to Crime, where you've got a clear, explicit message that you're trying to communicate? Um, the project only started in November and the project involves an awful lot of collation and data preparation. So we haven't yet got to the point where we have any findings as such. So it's very hard to kind of give an answer about what the findings will be. Interesting. Thank you. So a question over here, I think. Just behind you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks very much for that talk. It was absolutely fascinating and very relevant to my work. Um, my name's Claire Sturgis, I'm a producer-director, and um, I had a project to pitch to the Wellcome Trust at the festival, which is a, a kind of collaboration with an academic uh, in Glasgow University, who's just been granted 850,000 from the Wellcome Trust for a major four-year study that has a really strong public engagement element that's not just about disseminating findings, but about really connecting with people and having a social impact. So he's asked me to uh, support him with the film element of that because Welcome is much more committed now to using film to help disseminate and connect with people. My question is, when you're working as a filmmaker with uh, academics and also academics when you're working with filmmakers, what are the common problems with understanding each other's goals, objectives, and differing agendas, and if you have experience of overcoming difficulties, what advice would you give, and um, would you share those experiences? I'll put you on the spot, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what we're doing is, is quite different to a Morgan Spurlock documentary or some of the other examples Jacqueline was talking about. What's always in my head is that this is in some ways a, a client film, it, it's not my film and that's what I always need to remember. And one of the things I did very early on was make sure that I, I was really understanding this research and so I, I made a, a horribly long framework document which we all sat around for hours and went through point by point to check that I understood it. And there was parts of it that I said, I think this is too theoretical for the film. I, I don't think anyone's going to be interested. I know it's part of your research, but don't put it in. And there were, there were other things that I said, this is really sexy. People will want to watch this. You know, we should talk about this. I, I won't say what the aspect was. And um, Steve had to very gently explain that that was indeed very interesting, but absolutely nothing to do with their research. So, <laughs> so I, I think it's just that. I mean, it really does come down to that constant dialogue and, and actually remembering it's not mine. It really is. It needs to, to fulfill their research interests. And that's, that was very much what we were looking for when we were taking someone mm. on, that we didn't want someone who would just kind of tell us yeah, I will do that and that and that for you. I mean, that's why we wanted someone who was an expert in kind of this kind of creative enterprise because that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. And we don't want this to be a boring documentary or just a film about what we did. Um, but it to have, have a really strong emotional impact to other people. And we can't do that unless we collaborate with people who know how to do that much better mm -hmm. than we can. I was very struck by, Michelle, the way that you seem to be engaging with the academic material, for example, that mm. Stephen and Emily produced or put in your way. Mm. So I wonder, just to, to follow on from your question, whether you two responded maybe to the kind of aesthetic and narrative questions that are Michelle's concern, mm. or that you've Sorry. had an interest in those sorts of issues. It's ongoing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 ongo yeah. it's definitely ongoing, and it's, um, I mean, it, it's tricky as well because we, it covers such a long time period that oh, we're looking mm -hmm. at. So there's really kind of iconic things from you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and we have more than enough that we need to get on with. But it's, it's very much oh. that we want it to look nice mm -hmm. as well as be interesting and you know, impact people's emotions. So they, they, so they watch it apart from anything else. But it's, we don't want it to be like a book that kind of sits on a shelf mm -hmm. and 
no one accesses. I mean, that's the point. We're not, and we're not, it's not just a kind of tick box exercise. We kind of want to shout about what we're doing, really. Mm. Does the film sit within a larger um, body of work to engage with the public? Is there a campaign, for example, where this fits in? And how, how are you kind of making sure that that film is integrated with the other communications that you're doing? Um, this project, which includes the film, is the third grant which I've had on uh, thatch right social and economic policies and their impact on crime. So the first one was um, very much a kind of ground clearing exercise. You know, what's, what's out there in terms of the surveys which the UK is fortunate enough to have that could be used to explore the impacts. And the second project, uh, the, sec yeah, the second grant was um, from the British Academy to hold a two day seminar um, in London where we get, or well, we got, um, lots of academics to talk about particular areas and the way in which they had kind of spillovers into other effects because quite often academics are experts on you know, housing or education or the family. They don't necessarily think because they're not asked to think very often about how changes in, in that silo might have had changes in other silos maybe five or six years down the line. Mm. Um, so we have already five or six journal articles that were published and then an edited book which came out in February of this year published by the British Academy and um, OUP which did a lot of the kind of groundwork in terms of our thinking about what should happen. But that funding, or that, that, those analyses were very much at the national level. So it's either England and Wales, or Britain, or the UK. Um, so what we're doing with this project um, is to <clears throat> drill down much more into different regions. Um, and through using survey data, we're able to get at not just some of the kind of the obvious uh, things that countries know about themselves, like, for example, the unemployment rate or the levels of economic inequality, those sorts of things, but also to look at social values and the way in which those have changed over time. So to go back to your, your question, how are you integrating all of this? In some respects, we know the broad, you know, a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. You start with the edges. We know, <coughs> we, know, we know where the edges are, and we've been kind of building inwards, and this project tries to, tries to do that. So as Michelle and Emily have both uh, mentioned, there's a kind of constant dialogue um, between what we're finding um, and what we want to include in the film. <coughs> and the autumn, I think, is going to be actually quite a frantic... I haven't yet told either of them this yet. Fra quite a <laughs> frantic period, because we will have the data set ready and we will have analyses that we're working up and we'll be turning around to Michelle and saying, you know, you know when we said it was this, no. we don't think it's that, we think it's this, and it's even more fun, it was even more complicated, but we need to get it in. Can I ask one more question? We've just got that 30 seconds, so that's it's, to be quick. Oh God, I don't know, it might be too big. Um, the, the study that I'm involved in is um, to do with palliative care. And I'm aware very, very much of the ethical issues with mm. uh, patient recruitment for film and consent. Uh, is there time to talk about that, particularly with regard to the film for the probation service? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah fine. I mean, I'm happy. I don't have anywhere one to minute. go. I yeah. don't have anywhere to go at one. Are they going to kick us out? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we'll keep, keep to time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. promise that, anyway. <laughs> Maybe perhaps well, have we a chat afterwards. afterwards. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are, there are issues. We, um, for example, had an interview with a woman who uh, was a former offender who said that she didn't want the interview to be included in the end. Uh, we offered to pixelate her face, but she still want, didn't want to do it, um, even though she agreed to it. There were also bits in the footage that we had where we had um, some of the people we had interviewed talking about times when they thought about taking their own lives um, and talking about how at times they felt like they weren't going to be able to stay stopped and we had to make some fairly... And, th and what's interesting is that lots of these guys say, yeah, use it, I don't care, you know, I'm quite open about these things. But actually, we decided not to put any of those things in because that was those individuals saying it, and this thing's on the internet, and it was there forever, and if they decide to get jobs doing something else, um, 
and you know the, the, the potential employers see that, then that's I think you know quite damaging. So we had a, if you like, a duty of care in some respects to take out some of the things which, although people have voluntarily said them and were quite happy for us to put in, we felt we shouldn't allow. In some respects, we kind of a bit like parents. We 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 prevented people from doing things which we thought would do them long-term harm. It's slightly different, of course, with palliative care, because those people will be dead. But even so, there may be, thing, there may be relatives of theirs that yeah. are affected by it or who are identifiable by it. In another project, which I did, which was based on data from the 19th and early 20th century, um, Petty Session, as a magistrate's court records, even though this stuff was publicly available, um, we anonymised all of the cases wherever we could, partly because it was in a very small town, it was in, in Crewe. And we didn't want people who had the same surname as some of the people that we were talking about who were prolific offenders, either bigging it up mm -hmm. because their granddad was a prolific offender or feeling embarrassed because their grandfather had been kicked out of Crewe because he was a sex offender or things like that. So even though the data was all in the public records, we still chose to completely anonymise it. A nice note to end on, I think, actually, that academic um, disciplines have quite perhaps a lot to teach, documentary, film, about ethical practices mm. as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and the speakers, and thank you for coming.